been wonderful speaking with you a couple times uh, pre previous previous to uh, this conversation today. Uh, I'm personally super impressed with what you guys are doing at, at over at Regenerative Organic Alliance, and uh, and also your passion for change. Um, in addition, I learned in our last call that you love kale and all cruciferous veggies, and you make your own tortillas, which is amazing. Um, maybe I need to go to Guatemala because mine don't turn out very well. <laughs> and um, so th there's just a lot to love. So anyways, um, a little bit more formal. Um, how did she get here? So regenerating the living crust of the earth has been Elizabeth's mission since she was first exposed in the 1990s to the harmful practices of industrial agriculture and the power of building thriving food systems. Thus begun the long journey of examining the deeper systemic policies of agriculture and advocating for programs that reward holistic farmers. Now, as the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance, Elizabeth is overseeing the launch of a revolutionary certi certification program, Regenerative Organic Certified, also known as ROC. The term regenerative risks becoming the next buzzword as it is adopted by large chemical ag. Elizabeth is leading the charge to ensure that the regenerative that a regenerative is intrinsically linked to organic. Regenerative organic agriculture is farming in a way that heals our precious topsoil, draws carbon down, creates thriving ecosystems, and equity for those who live and depend on Earth. And above all, her greatest honor is to serve a planet that is in tremendous need of each and every one of us. And scary fact: in the 37 seconds it may have taken to read that brief bio. The earth has lost the equivalent of 18 soccer fields of living topsoil. The solutions to uh, the solutions to our modern day ecological crises lie right beneath our feet. So without much further ado, uh, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Elizabeth. Uh, again, Richard's going to mute everyone. Please uh, post questions to the chat and uh, let's have a wonderful session. So Elizabeth, Zoom is yours. Thank you, Josh. Thanks to all of you who came at the end of your work day to learn a little bit about what we're doing here at the Regenerative Organic Alliance. Can you all see my screen? Perfect. I love to see your faces. If any of you who aren't showing yourselves feel like turning your camera on, it's really nice to see you. And I just wanna compliment you all for being climate activists, climate warriors, and being in on this journey, this fight, this battle that we all need to be in on together because this is, um, you know, it's urgent. It's the time is now. It's been happening for many years and many of us have been aware of that, but it's, um, you know, just becoming more pressing every day. And I think a lot of people are really queuing in on this as we wipe out species all over the planet, as we wipe out topsoil, as, as we continue to wreak this devastation on the earth, we actually can look at agriculture as a solution instead of a problem. And so it's, there's really exciting potential here and really powerful ways that we can make changes now. And so I'm happy to be here to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the Alliance. And um, first off, just as we're called the Regenerative Organic Alliance, and we exist to promote regenerative organic farming as the highest standard for agriculture around the world, which is a pretty lofty goal. Um, such a lofty goal needs to be backed up by really amazing founders, and that we are. We have Patagonia Company, Dr. Bronner's, and the Rodeo Institute as our founders. And we also, um, the, the Alliance is also founded by a number of other amazing organizations that have been doing this kind of work for a long time. This includes Compassion in World Farming, Demeter, Fair World Project, uh, Grain Place Foods, Maple Hill Creamery, and White Oak Pastures. Today, I just want to give you all some of the highlights of, of our program and the, um, these intentions that the ROA has set out to accomplish. And really, the first is going to be like, why, why do we need this? I don't think I need to say that to you all. You know. Um, but why do we need it? What is it and how and where did we do it and, um, and where we are now? And so um, with that, we just set the stage here of like, why do we even need regenerative organic now? We know industrial agriculture and factory farming are top contributors to climate change. And we need to shift the focus. We need to shift to clear and calculated changes to our food and agricultural production systems to make regenerative organic agriculture the new model, both locally and globally. 
and looking at specific ecological and ethical approaches to farming can produce immediate improvements to soil health and the well being of animals, to the farmers, and to the workers. Really, what we do to the soil, we do to ourselves. It is the bedrock of our food system, of course, and also fibers. Anything that you wear typically is grown unless it was manufactured or made out of synthetic materials. And so looking at this and considering that degraded soil will threaten our entire way of life from the productivity of our cropland to the health of the foods we eat to the availability of the materials that we rely on for clothing, for building, and much more. Thinking about those incredible diversity of microorganisms in the soil, it mirrors the diversity of ecosystems around the world, as well as the diversity of the organisms in all of our gut. So we think about that soil microbiome being very similar to the microbiome of our gut. When we deplete and erode soil through industrial farming practices, we are endangering the complex balance of the natural systems, but also ourselves and humans are sicker than they've ever been. Cancer is one of the leading rates of death along with other diet related diseases. So looking at ways that we can try and repair this and um, address farming, the changes that we need in farming with regenerative organic methods that are gonna restore and build soil, that are gonna protect these ecosystems and protect the people. And I'm gonna be done with the dark stuff now. We're gonna move on from this um, the, the dark and heavy hitting slide and move into this. This is the new Regenerative Organic Certified. It's, an, it's a new label. It ensures soil health, animal welfare and worker fairness. And you may ask, and people ask me all the time, like, oh my God, another label? Are you kidding me? Like there's enough labels on our food and consumers are confronted with a sea of labels when they're out there making their purchases. And so adding one more to it, I think some people uh, didn't think that was the right solution, but the folks who founded the ROA really were looking at finding this new label to be a very encompassing label that would let individuals connect with a whole suite of values that extend beyond the food you're consuming or the clothing that you're purchasing. And this is really what sets Rock apart from other certifications. By choosing Rock products, consumers can know that just at a glance that their purchase is making a positive impact at every level, environmentally, ethically, and socially. Um, you know, this, this program began three years ago, and I'll tell you a little bit about our pilot program in a few minutes and how we went about it. And I would just add, you know, now in this time of COVID that we've had a lot of delays. We've all had a lot of unexpected uh, changes in the last year, of course. And uh, one of those for us meant that it was a, a long delay in getting out to really implement our program and scale it. So there aren't a lot of rock products on the market yet, but we fully expect and anticipate many, many products to be available on the shelf come 2022. So one thing I would say first off is after having worked in organics for much of my career, uh, organic is the highest claim that you can purchase right now. And it is still a claim with a lot of integrity and there is, it, it does require many, many different aspects like is listed here on the slide. It prohibits synthetic chemicals, prohibits GMOs, prohibits antibiotics. However, there is, Little enforcement in the organic program under the National Organic Program that's administered by the USDA. There's little enforcement of the best soil practices, so soil health practices, excuse me. And there are also very limited rules for animal welfare. And there are absolutely no conditions for farmer and worker fairness. Uh, regenerative here, this middle panel is something that's become quite a buzzword, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, there's a lot of people jumping on that bandwagon and that's great, except that there's concern that it's going to become, it's gonna go the way of sustainable or natural as more and more large companies realize, hey, there's great marketing opportunity here. People love regenerative. So we're just gonna put a regenerative claim on it. There's no legal definition for it. So anyone can say it. It, it does focus on sequestering carbon in the soil, which I'm sure resonates with this group and with many people who are paying attention to what's going on with our climate. 
It usually indicates that the practices are aimed at increasing soil health. However, there are a lot of cases where regenerative is claim is put on products that are grown with Roundup, like Roundup Ready corn or soy, where they just add in an additional rotation. So uh, it doesn't prohibit pesticides or GMOs, and it does not include any social fairness. And so here's where we feel like the regenerative organic certified claim is going to really add in all the things that mean that are meaningful. This is the USDA organic plus very strict requirements for soil health. It has to be pasture based systems for livestock and that there has to be social fairness for farmers and farm workers. And we also have a buyer criteria. So any brand that you see carrying the rock logo has signed on to the buyer criteria, which means that they pay a premium to the farmer, they sign a long-term contract, and that they ensure other provisions to make sure that their um, farmers and their supply chains are um, stable and that they're stabilized by these long-term contracts. Um, this is also something that is unique to Rock, where we build, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I got ahead of myself. The, I first would go into the three pillars of rock, and that is soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness. And what I've got on this slide here are some of the key tenants that you would find in the criteria on our website at regenorganic.org. You can see there with our soil health and land management practices pillar that um, there's there's different criteria that will require that the farms are building soil organic matter and that they are minimizing their tillage so that they're minimizing the disturbance to the soil and the soil microbiome, that they're implementing cover crops and keeping that uh, vegetative cover on the land so that there's not bare soil blowing off in the wind. Um, our crop rotation sequence requirements are much more robust than the NOP because they they require at different levels of certification that you have a certain number of crop rotations. Um, similar to the NOP or for organic, there's no GMOs, no gene editing, but you know that may be at risk in the future. There's been concern from folks in the organic sector about gene editing being allowed uh, for organic. And so that is something we watch closely. We also do not allow hydroponic systems with the rock framework. And many of you may not realize that probably most of the berries that you're getting are coming from hydroponic operations. And typically those are going to be down in Baja where they're reappropriating water and sending it to greenhouses or hoop houses where these crops are grown in plastic containers with a, with a different medium like coconut fibers, but with imported nutrients. And um, we definitely have a very strong belief that hydroponics should not be allowed in organic. Um, the soil health pillar also promotes biodiversity and uh, promotes bringing back animals to the farm and incorporating animals in a way that is holistic and that improves the health of that land. And so those are just some of the key differences in soil health. Another one that's not listed here is that we do require soil testing and we are collecting the data and we intend to show over time how regenerative organic practices are going to increase soil organic matter. And there's all kinds of benefits that come with increasing soil organic matter. Most of you have probably seen Kiss the Ground. How about a show of hands for everyone who's on video if you've seen Kiss the Ground's film. And so you learn there how soil can be like a living sponge. And as you add organic matter, its ability to absorb and retain water is greatly increased. And so those are some of the key tenets of our soil health pillar. If you look at the animal welfare, we recognize the five freedoms of animal welfare advocates, and that is a freedom from discomfort, freedom from fear and distress, freedom from hunger and pain, injury, or disease. But I think most importantly is that last one, that it's a freedom to express normal behavior for that species. So for most species of livestock, this means living on grass and, and living on pasture and being allowed outside and having not just outdoor access where it's a concrete porch out a little portal for a chicken breed that doesn't even know how to forage or go out in the pasture, 
but rather that they are building their livestock systems with breeds that are suited to foraging and to, um, to having a grass-based system. We also have other restrictions around transportation because that's a really stressful stage for animals when they're being transported to slaughter. And then also that the, the slaughter houses are meeting the provisions and, and ensuring that the, the stress is minimized to those animals. And we don't allow CAFOs by the EPA's definition of a CAFO. The social fairness pillar here, some of the key tenants are listed and that includes the fair payments to the farmers, the good working conditions. Here in this last year of COVID, we saw what happened to farm workers and to food service workers as they were not protected and they weren't given the proper PPEs, they weren't given proper space and those populations got sick and died at record rates compared to other populations who were able to stay home. Um, there's also provisions in there for capacity building and for freedom of association and to have democratic organizations so that the workers could say what they wanted, what they thought they needed rather than what their employers think they need. Um, there's no forced labor, there's no human trafficking, no child labor, and there needs to be full transparency and accountability. And so those, those are some of the central tenets of the ROC framework. This is a slide I was going to show you a moment ago is that we have basically built in the concept of continuous improvement so that a farm enters at bronze and progresses to gold. Very few farms will enter and get to gold right away because it's super high bar. If you see a gold rock logo, you know that that company has gone to great lengths or that farm has gone to great lengths to achieve that. It's um, a pretty remarkable achievement. And we only had one of our pilot programs who actually attained it. Um, so this, this basically builds in the concept that you don't just arrive at certification and then you're done, you go, you don't need to ever make any improvements. It, it brings in this concept of a continued conversation and con continued innovation and adaptation for um, all the learnings that we have. This is really emergent science. We learn, we're learning so much about regenerative practices in different places and looking at the soil, we're learning a lot about what we can see in the soil um, you know, if you think about the fact that there's more living beings in one teaspoon of soil than there are humans on the planet, and that scientists have only identified about 15% of those living beings or the interactions that they take, they undertake to bring nutrients to the plant roots, that is, um, we've got a long way to go and a lot of learnings to be had. And so it's really exciting. It's really an exciting time, I think, um, as everybody is looking at soil now, it's become a really sexy topic. And it's kind of ironic because just a couple of years ago, you'd think we were pretty dorky to be sitting around talking about the soil, but now everybody's talking about soil. So that, um, I think that is just super encouraging. And um, knowing that you all are here, I think you probably would be in the same crowd. I don't know if you, any of you have seen the meme of the person who's sitting at the party all alone. And it says, when you all you want to talk about is regenerative or party, but, I'm kind of that person. I haven't been to any parties, I guess, in the last year, so it's, it's hard to be isolated. Um, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about where we tested out this rock framework. The pilot program it was a very global program just because of our founders with Patagonia and Bronner's leading the way. That meant that we needed to get out to their supply chains, and um, that involved some very complex audits in distant regions and training auditors in other languages. We didn't do the training in the other languages, but ensuring that they were, would be able to implement our framework. And so we, um, we were in India quite a bit. Patagonia works with several different groups of cotton producers in India. Dr. Bronner's, where their famous mint comes from, if you like that peppermint soap, there's a beautiful co-op that um, we, worked with and, and inspected in India. Um, it also included Lotus Foods and uh, you're probably familiar with Lotus Foods and um, they brought in basmati rice in India. And then we also were in Sri Lanka. We, um, we went over to, over to Africa to look at the palm 
operation that Bronner's has been involved in building up into a vertically integrated operation of smallholders who own their own production facility. It is not the kind of palm oil that is destroying forests. It is building forests. They have a whole, a huge agroforestry program and a lot of really beautiful work that they're doing there. We also were down in, in South America with Guayaquil. We went and looked at their a mate farm in Argentina. We were in Central America to look at tropical fruits and that was in Nicaragua. And then if you look up into North America, we went from east to west and looked at all kinds of different farms for, for the dairy. For example, we looked at three different types of grass-based dairies from Northern California to Michigan to, to uh, Pennsylvania and New York. We also were in the middle of the country um, seeing how uh, the nation's most famous pioneer in organic popcorn, David Vetter, grows his popcorn. And there's another great movie, if you want to uh, write it down, is um, it's called Dreaming of a Vetter World. And it talks all about the trials and tribulations that the Vetter family had by farming organically. They were surrounded by a sea of conventional farmers who thought they were totally wackadoodles and um, they ended up coming out of it as uh, real leaders and now they have grain place foods and they purchase organic grains from all the neighbors who used to laugh at them. So um, we also worked with Nature's Path Foods up in Canada and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Nature's Path with their all their oats and hemp and, um, and the herb farm up in Oregon as well as Tablas Creek Vineyard for any of you who like wine. Tablas Creek down near Paso Robles has been an amazing partner for us and they produce some beautiful wines and they've done uh, remarkable work to help us advance our mission. Apricot Lane Farms, another amazing documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. Those folks have also done just a tremendous job in implementing regenerative practices and really teaching it to the world and sharing um, all their learnings. So um, that's just a glimpse of where we were for our pilot program. Once we concluded the pilot, we took in all the feedback we could get. I drove everyone crazy, I'm sure. Like, what's your feedback? What, what's, what are the learnings? What did you take away? What didn't work? What worked? And then we had four different task forces who took in all the feedback and, and compared the kind of the, the feedback that we got against the criteria and then made recommendations to the ROA board as to what should be changed. And then we changed the criteria in the framework. And so the revised framework was finished last summer in gosh, midsummer, I guess we finished that. And, um, and once that was done, we were ready for action and we started really building out the tools that we needed to implement the certification. Um, how we do this certification is we work with accredited certification bodies or CBs they have to be accredited to the NOP to do organic certification. They have to meet certain international standards for what they call conformity assessment. If you're doing a certification, you follow ISO 1765. And so we set up a very robust and credible system for implementing the certification using well-trained auditors who were competent in each of the pillars and who could um, partner with us to do this. And right now we are bringing on new certifiers. Um, we have a queue of certifiers who have applied. And what the plan is, is that we bring on more and more certifiers so that we get more people out spread around the world to, to take on more clients. So with that, I'm going to share a slide with you of some of the certified rock products that came out of our pilot. And you can still find the Dr. Bronner's coconut oil uh, on the shelf. There was a limited supply of everything because this was just our first go round. So we couldn't certify all of the clients um, or all of the growers that supplied every one of our operations. But the oats sold out very quickly. Basmati rice, you may still be able to find that. And then Patagonia Provisions, the regenerative organic chili mango is available on their website. So. The rock products do span many categories, as you can see here, if I can get my slide to advance, which it doesn't want to. Let's see, sorry about that. 
We'll just give it a minute. And if it won't advance, I'll just describe to you what's on the next slide. Just basically showing you all the different categories and that would include fruits and vegetables, grains, botanicals and body care, dairy, eggs, cotton, wool, apparel, wine, meat and leather. And there it is, <laughs> that's jumping ahead. Um, so yeah, and, and currently, the, the interest we're getting in all the new applicants who are coming in, about 50% of those are in categories of fruits, vegetables, and eggs. A lot of laying operations have been reaching out. We are getting interest from brands that represent the finished good products, as well as from farms. So while many of the crops will go into finished goods, there will also be certified fresh produce available. And brings me to some of the last slides here, which is basically just from our, our vision. We envision a world free of poisonous chemicals, factory farming, exploitation, soil degradation, habitat destruction, pollution, short-term thinking, corporate bullies, greenwashing, and fake food. And instead, we imagine a world where we all come together to create a healthy food system that respects animals, and land empowers people and restores communities and ecosystems through regenerative organic farming. And I think with that, uh, it's almost 30 minutes in, so I'm sorry I went a little over, um, but happy to just open up the floor. And I think there's a few questions here in the chat window I could scan through there if you'd like to do that, or we could just open it up. <clears throat> Yeah, let's, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you for the presentation. It was fantastic. Uh, again, love what your organization's doing. Uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's just jump into some questions and we can go through some of these. Some of them actually tie together quite nicely. Maybe some, some easier ones to get started. So uh, when I, Lori had a question about the, uh, the Rock Gold Company, can you, can you share with like who's kind of like maybe some tiers of where folks are falling in and then also the time frame it might take to go from silver to gold or, or whatever maybe sure so the rock gold went to guayaki for their mate however the amount of mate that was produced by that small farm in argentina would probably be enough to put about one flake in every bag of mate that they sell it's a very small slice of their overall supply chain but they they're uh, i i'm fairly <laughs> sure they'll be bringing in their other farms a lot of them are in Brazil and Ecuador. And so we have been working to get auditors trained and in place in those regions. So I'm hopeful that they're going to apply with the rest of their small mate growers in, in those countries and that we'll see a gold labeled product possibly next year, but it might be 2023. And so for a farm to move from bronze to gold, it, it does, one of the most challenging criteria that we have is that um, then at gold level, the farm needs to be paying a living wage. Surprisingly enough, it's really hard to get to a living wage. And so we, that was a big learning from the pilot. Most, most farms around the world from global south to global north are not paying a living wage. And those farmers themselves are also not earning a living wage. And so that's something to be really mindful of and to always keep aiming for. So what we require now is that they are transparent about why they can't pay a living wage and that they're always working towards that. Uh, right. The ROC framework has a whole addendum with all kinds of details about how that's calculated. And there's many different ways that people around the world have been trying to calculate and estimate what a living wage is. MIT has a calculator that you could plug in for you um, here domestically and so we recognize the MIT calculator plus 10%. Um, there's the Global Living Wage Coalition, uh, groups of people from around the world who have been working on assessing what a living wage would be. And it's gonna vary from region to region. So, you know, it's pretty complicated. You must've read my mind. I was just gonna ask exactly that. So um, another easy one, what, what country in Africa were you uh, piloting the program? Ghana. Ghana. Yeah, we're in Ghana, but I can say we have a very large cacao 
a, a group of cacao farmers in Sierra Leone. It's been a really exciting project. There's 13,000 farms coming in there. It's a long audit. <laughs> And uh, so that whole group that supplies that cacao, it's a total of 35,000 organic farmers, 13,000 of whom have also attained the fair trade certification. And so with ROC, we, we recognize 14 different certifications. We recognize and, and grant equivalency for those certifications. So if an operation comes to us and they have um, EU organic and fair for life or fair trade international, then certain criteria in the ROC framework are already met. And so we do that so that we don't duplicate efforts. And so when the ROC audit happens, it's basically an add-on audit where the auditor goes out. We have created this whole system using the gap analysis so that the auditors go out and just ask the questions for those um, criteria that are gaps. So another, another question that came up that I think ties in actually really well is Tia asked about the cost uh, to producers to utilize the labeling system. And then Matt asked, what, do you, what are you seeing from a premium? So I think, you know, what's the cost and then what's the potential benefit um, for a producer, a farm, a brand, et cetera, to, uh, you know, access and utilize a rock? We set up a fee structure to be um, really favorable to farmers. They pay 0.1% of their gross regenerative organic crop value. Um, set the minimum of $300. So, you know, anything up to $300,000 in production would be a $300 fee for the ROA. They, the farms do have to pay the certifiers who are doing the work. They have to pay for the time for the auditor and and for the time for the certification agency to conduct the review and to administer the program. Um, that's pretty standard for certifications. And so we've also been doing fundraising to raise a cost share fund. It's modeled after the USDA cost share. So if you're not familiar with that program, there's the USDA cost share allows farmers to get reimbursed for $750 per scope. So if it's a, a, a dairy operation, there are two scopes. They have farming and they have livestock. And so they can get up to $1,500 back to cover their cost of certification. A lot of times people who don't fully know the details say, oh, it's way too expensive. And um, you know, it's too much of a burden, but it's actually, if you look at your marketing dollars, it, it can come out to be very favorable for the farmers where they're not paying that much. It's, pennies on the dollar. And, and it's a really great way to differentiate yourself in the market. And for me personally, when I'm shopping, I'm going to typically reach for the organic label over a non-organic label, unless it's like something local and I know the farm, right? So um, I think there's a lot of drivers for that. There's huge growth and demand for organic products. And I think it'll be the same for Rock, judging from the amount of interest and the amount of inquiries that we field here at the ROA. I um, am confident that there's going to be a premium attached to it that consumers are going to be willing to pay. We do require that brands pay 0.2%. So we want brands to carry the day. Brands have to pay premiums to the farmers and then we want them to pay a premium for carrying that labeling claim forth on their package. And in doing that, we are trying to build in a system where the brands are going to be helping support the farmers to get better, uh, higher premiums. In um, kind of classic, like just to use coffee as an example, coffee, if you're an organic coffee producer, you'll get $1.26 a pound guaranteed. If you're organic and fair trade coffee producer, it's $1.41. And so every commodity already has prices established of what the minimum price has to be. And so that's just one example from coffee. Great. Okay, uh, scalability. I mean, you're talking to a tech crowd, a lot of tech folks and people think about growth and stuff. How do you, how scalable is the framework gonna be? I mean, how do you plan on scaling this up? It's a question. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll scale by having, the more certifiers we have, the more auditors we can train, the more we can get out and do it. And where we really need help is going to be in on the ground support to farmers. And so, 
you know, with our partnership with the Rodeo Institute, that's what they've been doing since 1970 something. They have been teaching farmers the benefits of growing organically. They've been demonstrating it through their field trials at their primary research station in Pennsylvania. They now have four research stations. They're in Georgia, Iowa, and in California. There's also been a lot of really amazing organizations that have cropped up, pun intended, um, to help serve this community. And that would be um, well, one of my favorites is Mad Agriculture. If any of you like um, poetry and you like Wendell Berry's Mad Farmer, then Mad Ag is amazing what they're doing to help farmers. Um, they've, you'd have to just go look at their site. Um, they've got this perennial fund where they're, you know, one of the biggest challenges for farmers is access to capital. And farmers need capital so that they can buy equipment. And um, they, they mostly do not have access to patient capital. And so that's something that the perennial fund has built into their system where they have like, they, they accommodate for that, what they call the transition trough when a farm gets off chemicals and, and fertility inputs and they have a decline in yields, but they don't yet have organic status. So they can't make up the difference in the premium. So their fund allows for that transition trough. And it also allows for farms to bring on new equipment that's really essential for no-till farming, for example, a no-till drill or a roller crimper device. So there's different devices that um, can cost a good bit of money. So that's um, another organization. There's, there's several global ones that I, I won't go into unless people want to hear about those. Okay, great. Uh, interesting one from uh, Mira. Uh, can you share your process in collaborating with BIPOC farmers in elevating their knowledge and regen, uh, regen farming practices and make sure their presence stays center stage? It's been, a, I mean, if you, read civil eats or counter and a lot of these things, there's a lot of uh, uh, commentary in regards to that. So what what yeah. are you guys there's doing lot, in this vein? There's a lot around that. So number one, we are a very new and young nonprofit and I um, have a small team and a small budget. So we can't, we haven't done as much as I'd like to do, but we are certainly aware of it and we are looking at ways that we can help support marginalized farmers to access our, our program by waiving the fees for them. We also waive fees for any type of farm that donates a significant amount of produce to um, their community, to food banks, food closets, to marginalized communities, to feeding people um, in their communities. So, you know, that's something that is really important to continue to address. There's also a lot of conversations going on around this kind of co-opting of these principles of farming that indigenous people have been implementing for many, you know, for hundreds of years. And it's, um, I think it's a really valid point and absolutely not trying to co-op a term or take this term from indigenous farmers in any way. I think there's just, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of complexity to it. And um, for now, the best thing I can do is focus on creating a really credible and robust certification and get this out and build enough resources so that we can continue to reach out to those communities and, and work with them. One thing I would say is between Bronner's and Patagonia, they, um, they're amazing in how much money they um, give to different, as for, to different communities. And there's a huge emphasis on regenerative ag from both companies. And they're both highly prioritizing by pop communities and helping support that movement. Great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I like Jason's question here because it's about your, your learnings uh, through the pilot. If you could see his question about, you, you mentioned the living wage. Uh, I hadn't heard of a lot of those calculators and things that you, you referenced. Were there other, you know, trials and tribulations, stumblings, whatever that you came across that, that you know, you've smoothed out or that, what difficulties in the, in the yeah. pilot? Yeah. Every Please share. Every Please share. <laughs> yes. We, we, got, we got time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There were, there were a lot. Um, I'll just take like one or two examples from each pillar. So with the soil health, <clears throat> originally we had, when the rock framework was first set out to the public, it said no-till. Like that was it, it had to be no-till. Farmers were pretty outraged. It, does, does anybody in this room farm? Anybody show of hands? 
<clears throat> okay, so farming requires some tillage. You need to like open up the soil in order to put the plants in or put the seeds in. It's just, it's it's something that is pretty essential. And as uh, Jeff Moyer, who um, is the the CEO of Rodale um, and was the chair of our board the first three years, he says like it's tillage is a tool. It's like a hammer. You can use it to bust the, something up or you can use it to build something. And so using tillage wisely was really the goal. And it was really at the, at the heart of it all, it was to minimize the disturbance to the soil because there's excessive tillage happening in many of the annual cropping situations that we encounter in this country. And um, if you could try to incorporate less tillage and minimize that soil by leaving soil, by cutting the vegetation and letting it lay there as a mulch or finding other ways to minimize the need to turn that soil over then you, you're not destroying soil microbiome. And so that will go a long way in building healthy soil and adding organic matter to that soil. So that's just one example from the um, soil health criteria. With the animal welfare one, we ran into all kinds of challenges and that's because how we do our status quo, how we operate now is, um, you know, it's, we have a very industrial kind of farming approach to animal agriculture. And so animal livestock are treated, it's, it's like a factory. And, um, and there's, there's just a lot of adjustments that have happened over the years where breeds are bred for production, are bred for efficiency. And so um, one of the challenges, like if you look at, if, if you eat chicken and you follow what's happened with chicken and the breed of chicken, the Cornish, broiler that 99% of the chicken out there comes from the Cornish broiler. Those were, it's a species that was bred for a very fast weight gain, very fast conversion of grain to, to flesh. And so it made that species prone to all kinds of problems with their legs and feet. And it's kind of gross, but it's just what it is. So these, um, these birds tend to have all kinds of terrible problems with their feet. Uh, I won't go into the details of those, but um, how we changed our framework to identify that, first of all, we had to acknowledge that there's a barrier to farmers because farmers have to buy their chicks from somewhere. Typically, they have to buy in their chicks. All the hatcheries are owned by all the big factory style producers. So all of those produce the same breed. There's now been a movement towards a slower growing breed. So a, a higher welfare breed of chicken and the more farmers ask for it, the more the hatcheries are going to step up to deliver it. And so with our framework, we have a requirement that you have to use a higher welfare breed that is, um, it knows how to forage and pack. It hasn't been bred out of it so that it just sits there and gets fed grain. It actually goes out and looks for insects and grubs and knows how to scratch around out in a pasture. And, and they also can only have a certain amount of weight gain per day. Another issue we had with the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with the animal welfare pillar was with dairies. There's a lot of practices that don't sit well with the animal welfare community. And they were also big barriers to adoption for the dairies because of the infrastructure that we have here. Uh, for example, in the Northeast, probably 70% of the dairy barns are what you call a tie stall barn where the animals go into their stall, it's a designated stall and there's a, um, they're, they're basically confined in that stall. And the animals, you know, if they're just going in there for a daily milking or to be fed, that's one thing. But if they have to be housed all winter long in a tie stall barn, it doesn't sound like a good life. So we um, have a provision that if you have a tie stall barn, you have to have, <clears throat> excuse me, have a provision to renovate and, and build a new barn. But that's you know a couple hundred thousand dollars possibly. So something you can't force into a sector overnight. And so we have built in a transition plan. So they enter in at bronze if they're in a tie stall barn, but they have only two years to get to a, a open air barn. Um, and then with the social fairness, as I mentioned, the living wage one was a big one. That one took a lot of work. Another one that we still haven't resolved is the use of labor contractors. And here in the US anyway, in the global north, you've got 60% of our labor, the people who pick our food and grow our food, they're not, they're, they're undocumented, 
and they don't have any protection under the law really. And it's their only, it's the labor pool that farmers need to pull from because there are no other people to do this work. And so finding a way to really address that and ensure that any labor contractors who are bringing farm workers to a farm for like that peak harvest season, that they have to be really transparent with us and they have to show how much they pay the workers, how they, what kind of um, provisions are in place to protect their health and safety and to give them a clean environment in which to work and to have shade and resting breaks and access to bathrooms, those kinds of things. Cool. Um, thank you. Uh, Eric who is a regenerative agriculture practitioner, um, super knowledgeable in the space, had some uh, several questions. You hopefully can touch on these um, briefly. Uh, what are the most important drivers for growing the, the rock movement? Uh, is, it, is it onboarding brands, consumer demand, or just getting the getting transit or getting farmers to transition and certified? What, what are you seeing? What's what are the key drivers for you or that you, in your opinion? I think the most important drivers are going to be at the ground level helping the farmers learn how to adopt these methods of farming and helping farmers with patient capital and with support. I think also consumer demand at a certain point, consumer demand is going to be a really important area to focus. Brands are here. They're knocking down our door. That's not the problem. And I think everybody sees that we are in peril and brands are looking at their carbon footprint and they're trying to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We work with a lot of international companies and so there's a lot more focus on that in the EU and in abroad. And so, you know, I think brands are, are on board and the main thing for me is gonna be holding their feet to the fire and ensuring credibility in the claim and ensuring that we don't let this term get watered down. Got it. Cool. Well, you might have some, some help out in Pennsylvania if you need it. I can always connect you and Eric, just let me know. Awesome. Uh, Matt asked uh, about the uh, expectations around adoption rate. Uh, will rock compare? Do you think it will pick up how the uptake like organic? I mean, organic grew uh, you know, more than twice of what normal food supply grew during COVID. Uh, what do you what do you think the trajectory is going to be for that? I think it's going to be super high. We um, it, farmers also are seeing all the potential in this. They're realizing the benefits as they incorporate more regenerative methods. They're seeing that they're resilience to drought and floods has increased by substantial amounts. Their need for inputs has decreased equally. So the benefits and for other farmers, they, they're seeing a return of all kinds of species to their farms because of the requirement to incorporate more biodiversity. That helps them with pest control. It also is something that I think is just like for some farmers I've heard from one in particular in India that I'm thinking of that was like, I, I heard birds that I haven't heard since childhood, that the birds came back. So you plant things and you provide diversity and the insects, the pollinators, the birds, the animals, they will come. And as we wipe out this planet of all kinds of diversity, we, those species, those, they have nowhere to go. And so it's really important to continue to focus on that and emphasize the need to have some biodiversity and incorporate diversity into your planting schemes. Great. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm trying to dovetail Stanley's question to Jason's. Um, so you're, what, 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 what objections to certification are you getting from the farm? Um, uh, you know, they, they would like to become certified, but they perceive it as too costly or risky or otherwise not worth it. Um, are there typical specific reasons? And then are there certain crop sectors where you think it will be very hard to onboard growers in those? And I think that actually ties into Stanley's question about power dynamics in agriculture. Um, you know, it's, there's like, you know, the, the cotton, corn, soy type thing. And those might, you know, so what are your, what are your thoughts on, on those, on those questions? Well, We'll start with the pitch to the farmers. Um, you know, most farmers don't want one more burden on them. And, and I know that from my many years of working in certification. What I've been really astonished by was how many farmers call up and they're super excited. <laughs> I'm like, that's great. I, it's kind of, it, it's just surprising to me that they are reaching out. They're not being told they have to. They are willingly 
wanting to sign up and get certified. And, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to eliminate any duplication between our other certifications and to try and alleviate the burden by having the cost share program and just by really trying to help work with them to facilitate the transition and, and that certification. Um, the, the part about it being too costly or risky, that's, um, that's really hard to answer to. I mean, we have our cost share fund. The risky aspect is something that farmers live with every day. They're constantly farming with their back against a wall and they're constantly the ones who have the tiniest margins and they need the most support and they need the most attention from all of us. Like, don't think that food should be cheap. Nobody should have access to cheap food because cheap food has made us sick. And the mantra here in the US is like, we, for farmers from like the more conventional groups is like, you are here to feed the world we're not feeding the world. We're growing corn and soy, most of which gets exported for livestock feed in other countries or turned into ethanol or turned into byproducts that make processed foods. That's not feeding people. And that's what I think is a really central tenet to keep in mind is like food shouldn't be cheap and we shouldn't expect to buy $1 dozen eggs ever. You can't produce a dozen eggs for a dollar. It's just crazy. And Yet, if you go into any Safeway or Costco or one of those places, you're going to find eggs for a dollar. Maybe. I don't know. I don't go to those places, so maybe I'm totally wrong. But I know that they used to sell them for a dollar. And I think maybe now they sell them for two or three dollars. But truly, if you eat an egg, it's one. Pro it's, it's a serving of protein. And one or two eggs is plenty. If you pay two dollars for your serving of eggs, it's, it's really not that much money. So... You know, just thinking of it in those terms, I think, is really important. Um, let me see what else did Jason. Yeah, ask? no, exactly. I mean, everything's flipped. Eight for, <laughs> in the last 40 years, we used to spend 18 percent on food. Now we spend eight and now we, it's inverse for healthcare. care. Now your yeah. message is absolutely going to resonate with that. Uh, Mira's question is great. And then I think I want to end with one or two and be respectful of your, your time. But what's going to be the tipping point for regenerative farming to become the standard? I mean, it's aspirational, hopeful, but. I, I don't know. I mean, if we haven't reached the tipping point now, when the hell are we going to? Like, it's like, look at the Gulf of Mexico. Look at the fact that we, how much soil have we lost since we've all been on this call? Like we are in peril and we need to address it now. Like it's not, I, I think that we're at the tipping point and that we all need to demand more from our system and demand more from our government, demand policies that support this kind of farming. With the Biden administration, I have a ton of hope that we are going to make a lot of progress. There's all kinds of legislation right now that is being put forth, the Climate Resilience Act, there's uh, Justice for Black Farmers, there's a lot going on at a federal level here and also in Europe. I was at a call at 5 a.m. this morning, in fact, with the EU Commission on Healthy Soil and they have a goal of making Europe or all like 25% of farmland in Europe should be organic in a very short order. That's a big deal. Here in America, 1% of our farmland is organic and 99% is conventional. So we need to flip that model. We need to aim for something much higher than 1%. We import, uh, gosh, I don't even know. I mean, we our demand is way higher than we can serve. And so we're importing a lot of organic food. And so rather than import it, let's, let's grow it here at home. Let those farmers get the rewards of higher premiums. Let those people in those communities have healthier air, healthier water, let the workers be healthier and let them thrive. And um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. my take on it. And yeah, of course, we couldn't end without having a carbon credits question. So why don't we do this? Can we get your hot take uh, on carbon credits, 30 seconds? And then I think most importantly, this crowd, like a lot of tech friendly people and stuff like that, what can people like us do to help support Rock? Um, so maybe just quick take on a carbon credits and then what can we do to help you out? What's needed? Please share and then, yeah. And then we'll, we'll let you go to hopefully a shot at, at the Mezcal. <laughs> maybe. Um, first off, carbon credits. Um, yeah, I, um, I think it's still really early in that. Everybody's kind of rushing into this chasing carbon thing. And 
I'm not, for us, it's more about healthy soil than it is about storing carbon. Um, I do, I would love to see farmers getting those credits. The rates that people are being paid for carbon, I think are terrible. $15 a ton per acre is not sufficient. Um, and that's kind of the average here. And there's some models that are looking at getting more money per acre. The problem with carbon also though, is that we, there's a question of durability. How long is that carbon going to stay in the soil? And um, what's the incentive to keep it in the soil? And so, you know, I don't think carbon credits are really the answer. I do love the ecosystem benefits where farmers would be rewarded for providing ecosystem benefits where they, you know, they are, are keeping their key performance indicators of like the increase in biodiversity, the increase in um, moisture retention or water retention or water infiltration so that we can see that they're not having to be cleaned up downstream. So there's other ways that farmers can be rewarded for ecosystem services. Um, so I think that would be a, a better way to focus our, our energy and, and time and intentions than on the carbon. Um, I think carbon also, you know, it's like, why don't, why don't we do carbon taxes? I know taxes aren't popular, but why not make those industries who are polluting and blowing out a lot of carbon, make them be responsible for that rather than being able to just offset it with a credit somewhere else. So um, yeah, for me, it's, it's more, more about that. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in that carbon trading, so be, be wary. Um, and as far as what you all can do, I think just yeah. keep on doing the work you're doing, keep on gathering that information and telling your people, spreading the word about it. I can tell you that when I got this job, I mean, my mom's been you know with me this whole time. She's seen me, what I've been doing. I've been working in food and agriculture and she could not say regenerative to save her life. Like it just was a word that just didn't come. It, it doesn't come to mind, but that was two, three years, two and a half years ago. Now regenerative is really out there. It's a, it's a pretty popular concept as we can tell by Cargill and Walmart jumping on the bandwagon. So, um, you know, I think keeping in mind that it's, it's a powerful concept and let's not screw it up. <laughs> let's keep it strong. So, um, yeah, as far as other things that you all can do is uh, be a skeptic. Ask the questions you're asking me. Um, demand more from companies. Let companies know that you give a shit. You know, that's, a, that's the main thing. And I would say like one of our partners uh, last year, one of our allies was Boochcraft. So if any of you are out here on the West Coast and you like Booch, Boochcraft, that's one of, that's, um, one of their, their closing lines is do something, give a shit and, um, and bring the party. And they're, um, they're pretty fun company. They source beautifully, really cool folks. And um, those are the kind of brands we wanna support. Look for B Corps, look for 1% for the planets. Those are the leaders. Those are the brands that get to lead the way and lead the day. And that's who we need to support. And so I would just say, you know, keep in mind that the, that's where you wanna put your money and where you wanna put your support and to let them know. So awesome. On that note, it sounds like you do have some hope that some companies are coming around and you have a backlog of farmers to certify and you need to hire more certifiers. So it sounds like things are moving in the right direction. They're totally moving in the right direction. We've fielded over 350 inquiries in the last few months, some from very large grower, grower groups and brands, some that would shock you, in fact. Um, and we've got about 100 applications in the queue for farms that are waiting for inspection. We have five certifiers we're working with now, and we have three more in the queue to get approved. And so, you know, as soon as we get more CBs on board, then we'll be able to get out and do more work. So, yeah, that's, awesome. I think that's about it. Well, that was fantastic. And we kept you over a few minutes. So if everybody could please unmute, if you, I think Richard gave you the capability and maybe we can give her a quick, Round of applause. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks for uh, spending the, the little bit of the evening with me. And um, it was it was great to meet you all and see you. Some of you, most of you actually now. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And uh, keep up the great work. And we'll be and in Eric's touch. Eric's going to be your next certifier in Pennsylvania. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Uh, a PCO should be coming along, I hope, soon. So all right. Thank you, everybody. Take care. All right. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you for attending. Bye. Bye.
cool. Everything good. Josh, I felt like we should just have all stayed on and had a whole conversation about it afterward. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Uh, guys, I don't know if you know Matt, that Richard and Will uh, helped me run the channel. Matt's a good buddy of mine who lives in Santa Rosa. So uh, yeah, feel free to. Uh, you can unrecord. I don't know if you can like edit the recording, so pause it. Yeah, you can pause the recording. Stop it. <laughs>